All right, friends, we're back at it, and today's topic is, topic is going to be legal principles applied to sport management. We're going to be covering quite a lot of material today, but don't worry. The goal here is for you to gain a baseline understanding of some of the legal issues and principles that you will be coming in contact with as a future sport manager. So really, the question we should first be asking is, what is sport law? Um, Judging from the pictures uh, on the slide, you can tell that a this issue in topic is quite varied. You could deal with issues related to labor law or contract negotiation or agency or player misconduct and regu player regulation, as well as just garden uh, garden variety torts, uh, premise liability issues, if someone slips and falls or injures themselves at your sports facility. But really... Um, sport law is the diver is the application of a diverse range of laws that exist on the books that relate to sport and recreation, and that are applied in a sport and recreation setting. So it could be something where a dispute arises over the interpretation of a law or a regulation, um, and in that situation, oftentimes sport lawyers work with their client or work with their organization and represent them with uh, resolution of that issue. And there are actually uh, very few laws that are specific to the sport industry, but they do exist, like regulations of sport organizations or, or sport agents. Uh, and as well, uh, over the years, Title IX, which was initially supposed to apply to colleges and higher education, but now specifically really heavily impact athletic departments. And then there's also different types of laws that impact the sport management industry, whether it's statutes, which are just laws that are passed by our elected representatives in the legislature, or there's administrative laws, which is rules and regulations that are promulgated by enforcement agencies uh, that are overseen by the executive branch of the government. And then finally, the law of private associations, which are rules, regulations, laws that are passed by private entities such as the National Football League or the National Football League Players Association or the NCAA. And they create their own rules that govern their own, uh, own procedures related to their business. So if a player engages in misconduct, not only might that player that, that um, agent break um, a federal statute or a state statute related to agent athlete conduct, but also the NFLPA and NFL, if it's an NFL agent, might have specific rules on the books uh, to discipline that, that, uh, that agent. So a very wide range of rules and uh, they all impact sport managers in different ways. So why study sport law? Why do we care? Well, as you saw uh, in the beginning couple of lectures and earlier in the book, the sport industry really is now a multi-billion dollar multinational international industry. And we're talking about high dollar amounts. Um, so the fact that so much money is at stake and the legal issues can be rather complex, sport managers really need to understand the basics of the law and how that works and how that impacts their employer and their job as a sport manager. And when issues do arise, whether it's a dispute or if it's potential legal liability, um, we as sport manager must understand how to detect liability, mitigate liability, and potentially settle any legal issues that occur within the legal system. So the sport manager of tomorrow really needs to understand basic legal principles, both from how to manage risk from a risk mitigation or risk management standpoint, but also when to seek legal assistant, assistance from counsel, whether it's your in-house attorney or it might be a law firm that your organization has contracted with, or it could be the need to reach out and actually find initial counsel. So in terms of a little bit of history of sport law, uh, early cases involving sport and the law focused mainly on tort law. And a tort is just a civil wrong where one party engages in wrongful conduct, like let's say that 
they are um, not watching uh, the road as they're driving, they're texting and driving, and that ends up breaching a duty of care that's owed to another person that is injured by their wrongful conduct. So someone breaches a minimum standard of care that's been set up by society, usually the courts or the legislature, and society is going to punish the person who breaches that duty of care and then compensate the injured party by uh, per, uh, making the offending party liable to the plaintiff for damages. So do you guys have any examples of early sports torts? Well, it could be that a, player's disp uh, a player dispute escalates on the field and then someone punches another person and that person is injured or maybe someone goes into the crowd or someone from the crowd intervenes on the stage uh, and that could lead to a sports tort, a wrongful tort. Um, issues uh, where sport and the law have interacted historically involve issues involving contracts and breaching, breaching those contracts, issues related to antitrust where um, the law of competition uh, is violated by organizations like teams banding together in a way that hurts competition, maybe labor law, maybe unionization within athletics, and then again tort law, civil wrongs. So today, attorneys in sport law uh, have been trained from uh, their inception of going to law school. So now it's not just people going, uh, attending law school and graduating from law school and then practicing and then saying, hey, uh, maybe working uh, for a sports organization might be something I'm interested in. People actually uh, in your shoes... Uh, attend their undergraduate program, graduate, then go to law school, specifically trying to become a sports lawyer right off the bat. So one of the benefits of law school is that it teaches you key communication, writing, and analytical skills that are really important uh, if you want to succeed as a sports attorney in dealing with problem, uh, dealing with the problem-solving method and identifying, diffusing, and remedying legal issues, hopefully before they, they start. And We've also seen a, a, an increase in people who are taking coaching positions, um, administrative positions, management positions, and uh, just overall uh, higher level, uh, C-level positions that have law degrees. If you look, um, three out of the four um, commissioners of the big four uh, professional sports here are attorneys by trade. So Commissioner Silver, Manford, and Bettman all served as labor law attorneys or worked in, um, in these big law firms before be getting into these leagues and becoming the commissioner. Also, general managers uh, have now, uh, it's not all that uncommon to have a general manager that has a law degree or a legal background. Uh, Mike Tannenbaum now with the, um, with the Dolphins and Theo Epstein now with the Cubs both have law degrees. And finally, uh, even some coaches, such as Mike Leach and Tony LaRussa, have law degrees and, and helps with that analytic mind. So with that in mind, we can just jump right into uh, some of the issues that sport managers should be aware of um, if, from a legal perspective. So the first thing is the notion of risk management. And risk management is really the process of developing a strategy to somehow maintain a greater amount of control over the vast array of uncertainties that might disrupt your organization. And we're talking about legal uncertainties. And that legal uncertainty could create liability and be in injurious to your organization. So there's two main goals of the risk management system, and that's to prevent risk from occurring in your organization and then uh, if there is an event that occurs, uh, intervening to the point where that risk is mitigated. And so the goal of the risk management process is to create a risk management plan. And in a risk management plan, that would be developing a plan, implementing a plan, and then managing the plan. And within your risk management plan, you want to make sure that legal disputes are prevented from occurring and that um, the organization 
is not put on the defensive by becoming a defendant to some sort of lawsuit. So in this DIM process uh, that you would use, which is going to be developing your plan, implementing your plan, and managing your plan, you want to use different elements to craft your risk management plan. So you would be trying to identify different risks that exist within your organization and then figuring out how best to treat that risk. Are you going to stop doing that activity that leads to that liability? Are you going to train your employees to mitigate that risk? Or are you going to purchase insurance or maybe uh, implement a system of contracts, waivers, releases, uh, bur uh, liability shifting devices to help your organization avoid that risk? And certain examples that are common when, an, uh, when a risk management plan is being created are avoiding liability for negligence and specifically premise liability. And we'll talk about negligence, but again, it, it's conduct that falls below a certain standard of care that one party owes to another. For example, when I was an attorney for the, at the time, the Phoenix Coyotes, um, I was assigned the, the task of heading up the risk management committee. And my initial objective was to create this diverse committee that included many different stakeholders so that I had a varying degree of, um, of opinions and perspectives. And with each of those stakeholders, I wanted to make sure I had someone from security, someone from guest services, someone from HR, someone from operations, um, so that I could get that wide range of perspectives in creating and identifying the risks that might uh, be specific to my, my client and then trying to craft a risk management plan that dealt with uh, identifying, treating, and then implementing my plan. And we've got a couple of examples here. But whenever you're dealing with um, risk in a risk management plan, you want to make sure that once you've developed your plan and implemented it, that you're constantly getting feedback from those within the organization so that the plan can be constantly updated, revised, and reflect best practices. And I've got uh, a resource on Blackboard that helps you un to further understand uh, the concept of risk management and the process of creating and implementing a risk management plan. So this is a living, breathing document that is very important to organizations. Above and beyond the process of risk management, there's specific areas of the law that often interact with sport managers. First one is the law of private associations, and we usually see the law interacting with sport where um, a court is asked to review the actions of a private association like the NCAA or the NFL and see whether or not their, action or their conduct was wrongful. Secondly, we, we see uh, oftentimes individuals be, uh, who have been injured uh, by a sports organization or have suffered an injury while engaging in an activity want to sue that organization or an individual under tort law. So we'll talk about that. Next there is constitutional law, administrative law, agency law, and also contract law. And we'll talk about these concepts. Um, <clears throat> The first one is the law of private associations. And think of it this way. Can a court step in and discipline the NCAA? Well, that depends. Well, what does that depend on, Jeff? Well, I'm glad you asked that. So we need to look at the law of private associations. And this, we need to keep in mind, is that these organizations, like the NCAA, like the National Basketball Association, like the, uh, the Women's uh, Professional Hockey League, the Women's National Hockey League. These are volunteer, non-governmental entities. They're private leagues, and therefore they are governed by their own principles. So if a plaintiff has been injured by a private association, so back uh, many years ago, there was a college, uh, an NCAA athlete who wanted to challenge uh, the rule that prevented uh, college athletes from uh, entering into the NFL draft. So if that 
player had challenged that rule, the that player becomes the plaintiff, and he or she would ask the court to intervene. And whether or not a court is going to intervene and review that sport organization's decision historically depends on several factors. But the default rule is that courts traditionally do not intervene with the private affairs of a of a private organization because that private organization knows its business the best out of usually anyone and courts and judges don't have that knowledge. But the exceptions are if the rule being challenged exceeds the scope of authority of that private association or that association has violated one of its own rules such as uh, let's say that the organization says a player is to be disciplined only one time for one per occurrence and that player is disciplined twice for one occurrence that could be breaking its own rules or if a if in a private association has rule uh, 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 ruled in an arbitrary or capricious manner meaning that's inconsistent and, and unfair um, or if the the rule violates the the public policy established by society um, then we would see a court stepping in most likely to review the questionable conduct that's being complained of. Um, sometimes a court is going to be asked not only to grant money damages, which is traditionally the only the, the default type of remedy a court can grant, but also sometimes a court would be asked to um, award injunctive relief. So we'll talk about that. So monetary damages is the traditional um, remedy that a court is going to provide to the plaintiff in the event that he or she wins. So monetary damage is just money, and it, 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 it uh, traditionally compensates the plaintiff for their loss and punishes the defendant in a public policy way that the defendant's usually not going to engage in that same conduct that led to the uh, liability in the first place. But in some situations, money is not enough. Um, sometimes a court is asked to grant injunctive relief, and that is uh, at times uh, because the plaintiff is trying to... Um, avoid some sort of irreparable harm uh, and it's granted to the plaintiff because money is not enough to compensate their injury. So for example, um, let's say that you had a, a, gir um, a girl who was a high school soccer player and she wanted to play in the boys competitive soccer league um, and she's quite good. But the team coach is told that the girl only uh, that uh, that only girls can play, uh, on girls' teams, and then if she plays in an upcoming tournament on the boys' team, that that team would forfeit the games in which it, she plays. So let's say that comes from the league's, uh, the, the league's governing body. So the coach and the girl's parents go file a lawsuit on behalf of the girl, because she's a minor, to obtain an injunction to allow that, that female to play in the boys' team. So the question is, why an injunction as opposed to monetary damages? And it should, I imagine that you would agree that money damages is not really going to make that girl, that, that female athlete whole. She's going to want to be able to play in that game. And so if, she, if she's prevented from playing in that game, then no amount of money would make her whole. So that's an example here. So, okay, now we're going to move on to tort law. So, like I said, a tort is a civil wrong that's committed by one person against another. And usually, the victim suffers the injury because of the uh, defendant's improper conduct. So, the court system looks at torts as a public policy rationale. Uh, we're going to, going to compensate the victim for their injuries, but then punish the offender by making them liable. Uh, there are different types of assault, but the most common types, uh, I'm sorry, there are different types of torts, but the most common types of torts within the realm of uh, sport management are intentional torts and unintentional torts, like assault and battery are intentional torts. And this an intentional tort is just where someone purposefully uh, 
engages in a specific action that leads to injury. So you cannot have an unintentional assault or an unintentional battery. An assault is where I'm purposely trying to make someone apprehensive about an, an unwanted or harmful touching that's going to be happening right now. I, if, I don't, if I don't intend to do that, but I still cause someone that apprehension, you're not going to have an assault. On the flip side, a battery is a harmful or offensive touching. So this is the completion of the assault. Um, you can't have an assault or battery without that intent. But if you do, you could also have that intent, even if you don't mean to do it. Recklessness can be the rec uh, if you're so reckless that a that a reasonable person wouldn't have done what you're doing. That could be sub be substituted for intent. So why are sports and torts so common? Well, oftentimes sports has an element of um, a physicality that we often see that can lead to lead to an injury. Um, so that's why sports and torts uh, go hand in hand. While intentional torts, while assault and battery are intentional torts, negligence is an unintentional tort, which means that it's some sort of conduct that. Not while well, the person doesn't do it on purpose, but it falls below a standard of care that's set by society and results in an injury. So it's an act or omission that causes injury to someone who the other person had a duty of care. And for the elements, you need duty, breach, causation, and some sort of actual damages, some sort of injury. So let's look at the... Uh, a couple of examples here in terms of duty, breach, causation, and damages. Duty is established either by the relationship of the parties or that the law requires there to be a duty of care or that there's a special relationship between the parties and that someone voluntarily assumes that, that, that duty of care. Here we've got a couple of examples. Let's say that you buy a ticket to a NASCAR event and you're sitting near the front row and what do you usually see? You see a big fence and you see a big fence because it's plausible it's, it, or even somewhat likely that there could be a crash on the, on the track and that debris could fly into the crowd. So because there's a foreseeable risk of injury that there could be a, a crash and that, that debris could go into the, into the stands, that the person who has, uh, that took your ticket, that, that you, they, you gave them a benefit by paying for the ticket, and then in exchange for the ticket, you got access to the facility, they have a duty of care to protect you from foreseeable risks of harm, which is that there could be a, a crash and that debris could go into the stands. So by virtue of you paying that price and exchanging value to give that money to the, to the promoter and they give you the ticket, that is a duty, that is a, a relationship that has been created by, between the two parties. And if they fail to protect you by perfect, protecting you from foreseeable risks of harm, that is a breach of the duty of care. And if that breach of the duty of care is if you can show as the plaintiff a direct connection between the breach and the injury, that is what causation is. It's a direct, uninterrupted line between the breach and the injury. We also have on the on the right hand side uh, a tragic, uh, another tragic, tragic example where a fan was struck by a puck uh, that went into the stands uh, during an NHL game, and there was no netting around the entire rink. There was only netting. In the most high high trafficked areas where pucks are being shot, which is behind the the two nets, so the plane the, the 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 deceased's family filed a lawsuit on her behalf against the Columbus Blue Jackets, and they said that the Columbus Blue Jackets breached their duty of care because it should have been foreseeable that these pucks could go into all areas of the stands, and because it was a foreseeable risk of harm that someone could be injured by them, that the Columbus Blue Jackets breached their duty of care. And they ultimately, I don't remember if they actually won or if there was a settlement, but it seems like they had a good shot to win here. Moving on, another popular area involving sport in the law is the law of agency. Agency uh, law is just where 
as it is a situation where one individual owes legal duties to act on another pe- person's behalf. So here, the agent would owe the principal that those specific duties. Um, you would have um, you would have a fiduciary relationship. So in the fiduciary relationship, um, there is the the principal who is the one that contracts with the agent, manifests consent to have that agent act on his or her behalf, subject to the agent's, or subject to the principal's uh, control. So agency, an agency relationship is created by contract. And so both sides have, uh, uh, give uh, in a contract, both sides promise to give something to the other side, and then both sides receive something from the other side. So in the realm of sport administration, we often see sports agents who sign a, a client who's an athlete to negotiate a contract on their behalf. And based off of that contract, the player's the principal, and the principal owes the duty to compensate the agent for whatever the agent negotiates on behalf of the principal. And they also need to reimburse that principal or reimburse that agent for any money that the agent has expended on behalf of fulfilling the fiduciary relationship. On the flip side, the agent owes to the principal different fiduciary uh, duties of care. The agent must obey and execute the instructions of the principal, must be loyal, meaning that the agent can't engage in any self-dealing, can't put himself or herself before the principal. So the agent's principles or the agent's um, the agent's best interest is subordinate to the principal's best interests. And then the agent must hold, must actually hold him or herself out to the standard of care by which he or she holds herself uh, themselves out to be. So then we move on to the law of contracts. So like I just said earlier, just like in how an agency relationship is formed, a contract is a written or verbal, sometimes verbal, agreement between two or more parties that creates obligations and provides benefits going both ways. So they create legal obligations to ref- fulfill their promises based on the contract. And in order for there to, to have a valid contract exist, there needs to be offer, acceptance, and consideration. Offer and acceptance is what creates a valid contract. Um, there needs to be for the offer a objective manifestation to be bound. So it can't be in an, an ambiguous statement. It must be pretty definite. And then acceptance must show unambiguously that the one receiving the offer, the offeree, is accepting the terms of the offer. And then consideration is going to make sure that both sides are giving something up and both sides are uh, receiving something. On top of that, their both sides need to have capacity, meaning that they need to be of sound mind and they need to be above the age of majority, which is 18 in most states. And then they can't, the topic of the contract can't be something for illegal. So contracts to put out a hit on another person are not going to be valid. In, a, in addition, if a valid contract has been signed, then we need to see what are its terms. What are, how do you enforce the contract? Because once you know what's in it, then we need to see if, if one side has breached it. So a breach is when a promise is not performed pursuant to the contract. And within the law of contracts, someone can breach a contract partially, which means that some elements of the contract are breached, but don't frustrate the entire purpose of the contract. And then sometimes a contract can be materially breached, which means that the entire contract is breached and that that party who has been aggrieved can can, act, can uh, pursue a remedy immediately. 
versus if it's just a partial breach, then you might not be able to just stop performing the contract and immediately try to pursue a remedy. A remedy is how that side who has not breached the contract is made whole. Uh, and then uh, you can either pursue uh, that, uh, pursue a monetary or monetary relief or injunctive relief. So if you have a, uh, if you signed a endorsement agreement if, as an organization with a famous uh, athlete, and that athlete does something to embarrass the company, and let's say that there's a morals clause in that contract, then potentially that contract could be materially breached and that company could get out of that contract and seek damages. In addition, as I said before in the risk management part of this lecture, waivers and releases are also contracts that operate to... Prov uh, to um, they operate in a way that 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 um, in consideration of that party seeking to gain access to that facility, that they will give up their right to sue. So again, it's just a contract. The par the party wanting to gain access to the facility is granted access, but they mo they give up their right to sue. So waivers are usually signed before someone participates in an activity. I'm sure we've all signed waivers uh, in order to sign up to use the rec center uh, or uh, sometimes um, rec center departments make someone s uh, sign a release or a waiver. Um, and these operate as a way to uh, show that that person understands and appreciates the risks of that activity uh, and then by participating and signing, they will waive the right to sue. And the legality of, the, of these contracts differs by jurisdiction. But oftentimes what we see as key issues is whether or not a contract is enforceable based off of its terms and whether or not there is a breach. Next, we've got uh, constitutional law issues or administrative law issues. Um, due process issues occur if a organization has acted in a way that deprives someone of a life, liberty, or property interest without their right to hear the charges against them, confront their accuser, if evidence is uh, not, uh, not allowed to be presented to show that the person is actually uh, innocent or, or that this is unjust. Um, oftentimes we see due process issues occur with NCAA uh, issues or professional sport leagues. So, for example, if um, the commissioner of a sports league uh, summarily suspends a player uh, without giving them any sort of notification as to the nature of the charges or allows them to respond to the charge or present take evidence, that could be something that um, deprives them of due process. Further, if a organization in sports is a state actor, which is a governmental entity or a private entity that has a certain association or entanglement uh, with a governmental entity, then additional due process is required, uh, and this sometimes creates an issue within sport. Uh, equal protection issues uh, occur where similarly situated people are being treated differently. Let's say that a, an employer has a policy that is facially neutral but actually discriminates against one class of people based on the fact that uh, of their gender or their race or their national origin. And so then that could create issues that, uh, that sport managers need to be aware, aware of. Unreasonable search and seizures, so security issues, that also comes up at time, from times, time to time. And then gender equity is also an issue with Title IX, where if um, in college athletics, if uh, athletic departments are not offering substantially similar uh, amounts of opportunities for athletic teams based on the population of their student body uh, and, and if funding is not equal, et cetera, and other um, elements, uh, other benefits uh, need to be equally afforded to both genders, uh, this could create Title IX issues. We're also seeing increased issues in, uh, involving protection of student athletes. 
Um, and this is coming in the form of player unionization. So what is a union? A union is really an organization that works on behalf of a certain class of workers to provide mutual benefits, aid, and protection of similarly situated people. Um, we're seeing uh, college athletes trying to unionize so that they can gain additional bargaining power. And what we're seeing them seeking is really just a seat at the table to gain additional benefits in terms of uh, getting a piece of the pie that the NCAA generates. So increased money, increased uh, uh, standards, uh, increased uh, standards in terms of less working hours, uh, ac and guaranteed access to um, medical uh, uh, treatment in the event that someone is injured and can't play football, et cetera. Um, and I'll leave it to you guys to think about how might unionization in college athletics really change um, college athletics as a whole, but just think about the arms race and in the gulf between the haves and have nots. If if there's a require if if organs if student athletes unionize and gain more bargaining power and let's say that they demand to be paid a, uh, a stipend of thirty thousand dollars a year in addition to their scholarship, think about the financial ramifications. And then finally we have intellectual property issues. Intellectual property is intangible property. And the intent of the intellectual property law is to protect the value, the goodwill of a good service or image. Uh, oftentimes, more recently, we see issues involving intellectual property related to trademarks and right publicity. Trademarks in the sense that it's a word or a name or a symbol that's used by a manufacturer or an organization to identify its good or service and then distinguish it from others that might compete with it. So um, the, the, um, the professional sports leagues all have logos and, and taglines. Uh, the 12th man, uh, what does that relate to? Does that relate to the Seattle Seahawks or Texas A&M College Station? Um, and then we're also seeing issues involving trademarks and uh, ambush marketing. Usually when there's a mega event, or such as the Olympics, we see issues of ambush marketing pop up where sponsors who have paid just ginormous amounts of money to affiliate with a mega event like the Olympics and, and be a sponsor, they're having to fend off competitors. Let's say that Coke is the sponsor of the Olympics, but then Pepsi tries to create a false impression uh, that they also are, are a sponsor of the Olympics, but not paying that money. That's uh, where ambush marketing comes into place. Additionally, right publicity is an issue where players or, or sufficiently famous athletes, um, their name or likeness or other identifying, identifying information are being used in a way that makes those other parties, uh, uh, that allows them to make money. So there's a commercial appropriation, and that commercial appropriation was, not, was done without that athlete's uh, permission. So here we've got an example of, of that violation of right publicity by um, the use of a brewery in Denver to create what was called T-Brew, which was a homage of sorts to Tim Tebow uh, in his icon iconic uh, Neil. But the problem is that Tim Tebow, Tim Tebow doesn't drink. And the question becomes, um, is there an issue of endorsement um, with the brewery? Uh, now that you have that t Tim Tebow uh, and Tim Tebrew. Um, so that could injure Tebow because two ways. One, he's not getting any sort of cut financially for them adver uh, using his likeness in conjunction with his advertisement for the beer and the name of the beer. And also Tim Tebow doesn't, or Tim Tebow doesn't drink. So does this create an impression that Tebow drinks? So you, you can further extrapolate on that. Um, we also have seen the, the Ed O'Bannon lawsuit against the NCAA wind its way through the courts involving violation of players' right of publicity through NCAA video games and the use of players' image by the NCAA. And that's uh, going to be a significant issue for years to come. So legal skills that apply to, to sport managers are understanding this problem-solving method that lawyers learn. And it really is about logic and analytical reasoning. So by understanding what is the what are the what's the significant issue that you're trying to resolve, what are the facts of the, of this of this issue, 
and what laws apply, that is really helpful in analytical reasoning. Another important issue or another important skill that law school helps to instill into sport managers is refining their oral and written communication skills. Uh, advocacy is really about strong oral and, and, and written communication skills. And then we've got some other uh, skills that are helpful that sport managers use on a daily basis. Negotiation skills, interviewing skills, and then learning about ethics and being an ethical person. So these are some skills. So uh, in closing here, here are some current issues that are uh, exist in sport law. So we've got issues involving resolving on-field disputes during Olympics, as well as ambush marketing. So the Court of Arbitration for Sport, which um, is an international body, at times uh, can be helpful with resolving on-field disputes. College uh, sport, uh, amateurism versus commercialism, uh, we're seeing uh, increased still uh, uh, commercialism in terms of the NCAA and their ability to generate money, even though it's founded on the on the principle of amateurism, and they're using uh, student athletes are not being compensated for the most part for the use of their likeness, and then uh, issues in professional sport related to uh, labor law disputes and collective bargaining negotiations, issues of commissioner authority and, and pun punishment for banned drugs, and then a real uh, hot button topic in recent years has been uh, player conduct issues uh, related to either wrongful conduct or expression of, uh, of beliefs. So uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, t uh, bring, drawing to light his beliefs that, um, that there are significant issues in the United States and he's trying to bring awareness to that. Uh, can, leagues, can the league suspend him or discipline Kaepernick based on what's in his contract or what's in his uh, in the collective bargaining agreement. So those are a few issues in sport law. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. There will be some additional materials on Blackboard that you can use to further your understanding. And as always, if there's any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you.